program. The Murphy Institute is a joint venture of the Center for Catholic Studies and the School of Law at the University of St. Thomas. My co-director is a member of the faculty of the uh, Center for Catholic Studies, Billy Junker, who I, is he back there? No, he's not, uh, wasn't able to make it today, or might be a little bit late, but um, on, on behalf of him and myself, I welcome you. We have a great speaker today. I'm so excited to be able to present this inside view of the Synod to you um, by an insider. Um, the insider is here because he is a friend of my colleague who I'd like to introduce, who's going to introduce our speaker. Teresa Collette is a professor at the School of Law. She um, met uh, 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 Dr. Grabowski and his wife. Um, they all served together on the Pontifical Council for the Family for a number of years. Um, professor Collette is also a member of the American Law Institute. I know some of law students are out there. Those are the guys who write the restatement. And she is the founder and co-director of the law school's uh, pro-life pro center. So I'm very, very pleased to turn the microphone over to Professor Teresa Collette. Thank you. That was very kind of Lisa. Uh, there is an old saying, though, that you can tell the importance of a person. It's in direct uh, inverse proportion to the length of the introduction. And Professor Grabowski asked me to say one sentence about him, which tells us how important he is, actually. Uh, Professor Grabowski uh, and his wife are in the process of co-authoring two books on marriage, but I've had the pleasure of teaching his first book on marriage as part of a law school class. As Lisa said, we met in Rome, and most recently, Pope Francis. I believe the Grabowskis were appointed by Pope Benedict, as I was. Uh, they are members of the council. I am a consultor. But Pope Francis uh, re-upped uh, re us, uh, invited us to continue, and he went further with Professor Grabowski. Professor Grabowski is the only North American invited to serve as an expert for the Synod on the Family, which meant not only did he observe the proceedings, but he contributed to them and actually got to vote. So it will be a wonderful thing to hear his insights that he had gained there, and we're fortunate to have he and his lovely wife, Claire, with us tonight. Thank you. Now I just need to get my slides. Um, he's coming. No worries. Oh, okay. I could have done that. Yes. <laughs> thank you. I should have done that. <laughs> thank you, Teresa, and thank you for the invitation, and thank you all for coming out on, I guess, what is for you a balmy evening. Um, so, huh. um, what I'm going to try to do tonight in a little less than an hour is to give you some sense of what happened at the Synod um, give you some sense of an interpretation, my own, of what, this, what I understand the synods to be doing in the ministry of Pope Francis. And then at the very end, I'm going to put on my um, theologian hat and make a few kind of critical theological observations. This is a picture of Claire and I actually greeting the Holy Father, Pope Francis, not at the synod, but in the fall of 2013, um, the last time we were all in Rome um, for a meeting of the Pontifical Council for the Family. Um, so I have three, uh, three tasks. Let me start by sharing three stories, all of them true. Um, so I had no idea I was going to be appointed to the Synod. Um, and I was getting to the end of summer. I had planned out my courses for the fall. I went down to my campus mailbox and there was a large packet from the Holy See that I pulled out and opened. And there on the top was a letter um, from Cardinal Baldessari um, the, uh, telling me that I had been appointed to serve as an audiutor or expert for the Synod. Um, and the last line of the first paragraph was, the Holy Father thanks you for accepting this invitation. <laughs> I know the church is the family of God, but I thought it was another family that was located in Italy that made offers that you couldn't refuse. 
So at that point I said, okay, I'm going to the Synod. Um, and I tried to scramble and find some colleagues to cover my courses for me and they were kind enough to do that. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about the Synod and what we did and, and my role and, and what came out of it. But so Pope Francis was actually with us for all of the general sessions of the Synod um, in the front of the Synod Hall. And during our coffee breaks, he would come down to the foyer of the Synod where they had uh, cappuccino and espresso and lots of dolce and all this. And of course, Pope Francis, when he came down, he was surrounded instantly by 70 people, you know, waiting to greet him, to snap selfies with him, to do all, all kinds of stuff. And I kept, you know, other people, other, other experts, observers, bishops kept elbowing me and saying, have you, have you greeted the Holy Father yet? Did, did you greet the Holy Father? I was like, you know what? I, I've had the opportunity. It was wonderful. Let other people have their chance. And finally, I got tired of telling archbishops and cardinals, no, I ha And I was like, fine. You know what? I got, I'm, my, my wife's going to kill me if I don't do this. I, people will tell me I'm an idiot. I should go. I should greet them. So this is my practical thinking. I decided last day of the synod, um, because Saturday afternoons tended to be quieter, I'd, you know, I'd catch them during the break. Little did I know we wouldn't have a break. We just voted the synod document, um, paragraph by paragraph, the whole. Um, so that, <laughs> so much for that plan. But um, I didn't know if that was going to happen. So in the morning, at, on the final Saturday, they announced that the Holy Father had a gift for all of us, a beautiful bronze relief of the Holy Family for, who participated in the synod. And so when I came to the synod that afternoon, I went to the front desk because you had to sign for your gift and get the gift. And so I'm there at the front desk and I'm signing and I hear a commotion behind me and I just ignored it. My wife tells me I'm good at doing that. Um, so, you know, and I, so finally I turn around and Pope Francis is standing there with his hand out. <laughs> and I had this whole little nice speech, you know, worked out in my head. I was gonna thank him for coming to our country and for visiting our campus and all this other thing. And all of that just evaporated from my, I think what I said was, Holy Father, hello. <laughs> One of my students, who's a deacon for the Archdiocese of Washington now, said, well, at least you followed holy with father, because that could have been a lot worse. I, whenever you greet the Pope, there are always people from L'Osservatore Romano snapping your picture, and then I haven't even bothered looking for the picture on the website, because I'm sure if there is one, I look like that. So I, I'll, I'll stick with this one. It's, it's better. When I got back from the Synod, third story. Um, I had to see my dermatologist because I had a little lesion that from sun damage that he wanted to remove. And he warned me that you could get a little bit of bruising because it was in my temple area. So sure enough, he did the procedure. Three days later, the whole side of my face was green and purple and I had 10 stitches on the side of my head. So I'm walking around campus and people are like, John, welcome back. What happened to you? And I was like, well, Pope Francis said he wanted frank and open discussion at the Synod. <laughs> I got a lot of mileage out of that. It was pretty good. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about synods. Uh, the Synod on Bi of Bishops was established by Pope Paul VI in 1965 in the wake of the Second Vatican Council. The council was such a positive experience for the church that people kind of wanted to capture the lightning in the bottle. And so the synod was established as a way to do this, to bring bishops together from all over the world to give their input to the Holy Father to assist him in his teaching ministry as kind of an extension of the council's um, teaching of Episcopal collegiality, the Pope and bishops teaching as a college um, together. Um, so prior to the 2014 Extraordinary Synod, the 2015 Ordinary Synod, there had been 13 ordinary two extraordinary and nine special, and special synods are regional synods, synods of specific regions of the world. So um, the Synod on the Americas, which produced Ecclesia in America, um, that was 1998, 99, I believe. Um, if you want more information on these synods, um, go to the USCCB website. They have really helpful information pages or the Vatican website. There's a whole web page on the synod and you can get actually the bylaws um, for the Synod of Bishops. That actually is a shot of the opening prayer vigil for the Synod 
um, in St. Peter's Square. Not, a, not the best shot. One of the things <clears throat> that happened during our time there was the anniversary of the 50th um, year since the Synod was established. So we had a celebration on Saturday, October 19th, the second Saturday of the Synod. And how do you have a celebration in Rome? You have five hours of speeches <laughs> in Italian. One cardinal spoke in English, but so it was, but we had a lovely children's choir, so that kind of, that helped. Um, but Pope Francis's speech um, that he gave there, uh, if you haven't seen it, you really should. Um, it's, it will give you huge insight into Pope's, Pope Francis's vision for his own ministry and his vision of the church. He called for, in his words, a church that is synodal at every level. And he pointed out to us that the word synod comes from a Greek word that means walking together. So it means laity, pastors, the Bishop of Rome, all walking together. He said, it's an easy concept to put, to express in words, not so easy to put in practice. But he said that this was part of promoting a healthy decentralization. That phrase comes from John Paul II in the church. Um, he continued, he said, the church is like an upside down pyramid with the top on the bottom, which is why the ordained are called ministers. They serve the other. So those at the top are actually at the bottom because they're the servants of all. He said, the census fide, the sense of the faith, makes it impossible to rigidly separate the ecclesia docens, the teaching church, and the ecclesia discens, the learning church, because even the flock he said, has a nose for discerning the new paths that the Lord is opening up to the, to the church. So the, a syn synodality means the whole church walking, moving together, everyone in the church participating. But, and this is um, where some people who listening to Pope Francis find their blood pressure rising, what they don't often hear is that in his vision, this understanding of synodality is coupled with an equally strong understanding of primacy. This walking together, this discernment, this movement of the whole church is always cum petro et sub petro, with and under Peter. So the Petrine ministry is integral to this synodality. Um, so last year, 2014, we had the extraordinary, the most recent extraordinary um, Synod of Bishops. The two previous were in 1965, 1985. The Code of Canon Law tells us that extraordinary synods are called to deal with matters that require a speedy solution. And the order of the Synod of Bishops says things which demand immediate attention for the good of the entire church. In this case, the extraordinary synod was called to prepare for the ordinary synod. So it was envisioned from the start as a two-part event, a, a, a journey involving the whole church that would, would span these years. And you might remember that prior to the Extraordinary Synod, there was a prefatory document sent out. Um, people's input, the various dioceses were solicited for their input, their feedback. So a process of listening, of learning what's going on kind of on the ground in the church. The Extraordinary Synod met from October 5th through 19th of last year. Its theme was the pastoral challenges of the family in the context of evangelization. <clears throat> um, and this view of, this is a view for, of the Extraordinary Synod. Actually, you're looking from basically the seat where I sat in this year's Ordinary Synod. Um, so it was cardinals in the front, then bishops, then um, observers, experts, fraternal delegates, we were kind of in the nosebleed seat, well, you know, the, the top seats. Um, one of the things that struck me during the Extraordinary Synod was, <laughs> I wasn't there, but I have probably spent more time speaking to reporters in those two weeks than I had in all of the previous two years combined. And the press was so insistent with they wanted to talk about this issue or that issue, which they were sure was the burning question of the synod. And I kept saying, I, I think you're kind of missing what's actually going on here. Um, I think you're kind of not seeing the bigger picture. So when I went to the synod myself this last year, I kind of 
determined to tune out the press and the media narrative and just try to listen myself and get a sense of what was going on. And I really did come away with the sense that the press and a lot of pundits, including Catholic pundits, kind of missed the bigger picture. One, so the final report or relatio of the Extraordinary Synod became the lineamenta, the guidelines for this year's synod. Pope Francis's final address to the Extraordinary Synod is remarkable. Again, I, if you haven't seen it, if you haven't read it, take a look at it. Um, you really see Pope Francis as a product of his Jesuit formation and spirituality, as kind of the church's discerner in chief. And he pictured the Extraordinary Synod as a journey, and he likened it to Jesus's temptations in the desert, in the Gospels. And he talked about the temptations of the different voices that the church hears that it has to, in a sense, put aside in listening to and for the spirit of God. He said, one of these, a temptation to a hostile inflexibility, that is wanting to close oneself within the written word, the letter, and not allowing oneself to be surprised by God, by the God of surprises, the spirit within the law, within the certitude of what we know, and not of what we still need to learn and achieve. From the time of Christ, it is the temptation of the zealous, the scrupulous, of the solicitous, and of the so-called today traditionalists, and of the intellectuals. But then conversely, he spoke of a temptation to a destructive tendency to do-goodism, um, bonismo, it's hard to translate, that in the name of a deceptive mercy binds the wounds without first curing them and treating them, that treats the symptoms and not the causes and roots. It is the temptation of the do-gooders, of the fearful, and also of the progressives and liberals. And then finally, the t he spoke of the temptation to come down off the cross, to please the people and not stay there in order to fulfill the will of the Father, to bow down to a worldly spirit instead of purifying it, and bending it to the spirit of God. Classic Pope Francis, just discerning, trying to bring the church to balance in order to hear the Holy Spirit and move forward. Now, in between the two synods, we had another event, of course, the World Meeting of Families, um, begun in 1994 by St. John Paul II, also takes place every three years, like the ordinary synod. Um, up until recently has been sponsored by the Pontifical Council for the Family, but that Pope Francis announced to us at the end of the Synod is now being combined with the Council on Laity, possibly the Pontifical Academy for Life. So it's not clear how it's, what it's going to look like going forward. Um, the last one before this, one that we just had in the fall, was in Milan in 2012. And there, of course, Pope Benedict announced that the next meeting would be in Philadelphia and that he would attend, but then he retired. So the question was, would Pope Francis attend? And of course, Pope Francis about a year ago started saying, yeah, I'm, I'm coming. And his spokesman kept saying, it's not official until six months. It's not official. It's not, it's gotta be tough being a Vatican spokesman with Pope Francis. He, he doesn't follow scripts well, um, it seems. So of course he did come and came not only to Philadelphia, but to Washington and New York. Um, and if you were there or if you watched some of the coverage, um, there was that remarkable moment at the Festival of Families in Philadelphia on Saturday night um, when Pope Francis took his script and basically threw it away and just spoke off the cuff um, and gave us a rendition of what we talked about a great deal at the Synod, the, the gospel of the family. Um, and just in plain, simple Pope Francis language, talked about how the family is an integral part of God's plan of salvation. At one point he said, so great was his love that he began to walk with humanity, his people, till the right moment came and he made the highest expression of love, his own son. And where did he send his son? To a palace, to a city? No, he sent him to a family, God sent him amid a family, and he could do this because it was a family that had a truly open heart. The doors of their heart opened. That's Pope Francis at his best, speaking from the heart, speaking in clear biblical language that resonates with people in a very deep way. So a little, so this last synod, <clears throat> excuse me, 
the, the 14th Ordinary General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops. <clears throat> its purpose, the working document, the Instrumentum Laboris told us, was to continue the work of the Extraordinary Synod by reflecting further on the points discussed so as to formulate appropriate pastoral guidelines. That working document, that Instrumentum Laboris, was composed of the final report of the Extraordinary Synod enriched by further consultation and reflection, more consultation of churches around the world. <clears throat> there was a larger group that attended the Ordinary Synod. Um, the United States, in, instead of sending four bishops as we did to the Extraordinary Synod, we sent nine bishops. The theme of this meeting was Jesus Christ reveals the mystery and vocation of the family. The methodology of the Synod, in his opening address to us, Pope Francis encouraged us to adopt per, perhesia, um, fearless truth-telling, pastoral zeal, doctrinal wisdom, frankness, always keeping before our eyes the good of the church and of families. He said it was not a political or a parliamentary discussion, but again, an exercise in discernment, cum petro et sub petro, with and under Peter. Um, and he said, and this actually became a headline in L'Osservatore Romano. He said, the only method of the synod is to open up to the Holy Spirit with apostolic courage, with evangelical humility, and with confident, trusting prayer. One of the things that really became clear is Pope Francis really expects and believes that the Holy Spirit works through an event like the Synod, with all of its imperfections, with all of its humanness, and we'll talk about some of that humanness, but he really believes this is how the Holy Spirit guides the church and guides him as the church's universal pastor. It's worth remembering uh, the words of another cardinal some years ago, a cardinal by the name of Ratzinger, um, before he got a different name and a different job title. Um, he said, at the beginning of his ministry as the Cardinal Prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, that rightly understood Catholic teaching is neither conservative nor liberal. Those are political labels. Um, in the 19th century, uh, the theories, <clears throat> the market economic theories of Adam Smith and T.R. Malthus were referred to as economic liberalism. Yesterday's economic liberalism is today's economic conservatism. In the church, we're not interested in political labels. We're interested in truth. We're interested in orthodoxy, right teaching, but also orthopraxis, living the truth that we profess and believe. I heard many bishops at the synod say, and it, it was really striking to me, we are, we are not here to follow the script that the media has written for us. What the media wants is to take and this is bishops from Europe and the United States, take the culture wars that are going on and project them into the church. That's not the purpose of why we're here. So Pope Francis at the beginning of the synod exhorted us to, in his words, eschew the hermeneutic of conspiracy, which he said is sociologically weak and spiritually unhelpful. Again, there's something, there's a deeper purpose in the synod than politics however we understand politics, whether those be uh, cultural politics or ecclesial politics. So we spent our time in the Synod in two basic moments, two basic forms. Um, General Assembly sessions where we were all together. Um, and one of the interesting things was that everyone in the General Assemblies got to make an intervention, got to make oral remarks for three minutes, and it was a t hard three minutes. They would cut you off. You ever see a Cardinal's microphone get cut off? Wow. Um, they would literally cut you off if you went over that. Um, but so all the bishops got to make an intervention if they wanted. All of the observers, um, the auditors, got to make interventions. All of the fraternal delegates, the representatives from other churches, got to make interventions. The experts, there were 24 of us, we didn't get to make interventions. I said to one of the others, we're like the children of the synod. They want us to be seen and not heard. Um, 
it's kind of funny. But um, what we what our role was instead was to actually uh, summarize and then synthesize all of the interventions and then present them to the small language groups as the kind of a, a baseline for their conversation. Um, there were actually 473 interventions in the General Assembly at the Synod. Um, but then, so we spent ha roughly half of our time all together listening to these kind of rapid fire interventions. Um, and then in small groups, circuli minores, one of the bishops said that should be translated as minor circuses. Um, <laughs> not a bad description. Um, if you look, I know it's probably hard to see the slide, but if you look in the far right corner, you might see a familiar face um, peering across the table. Uh, the three gentlemen with their backs to you at the front of that slide are Cardinal Pell, who was our, uh, our moderator, um, Archbishop Richard Smith of Edmonton, and Archbishop Joseph Kurtz, who's, uh, who was our secretary or relator. He's the president of the USCC. We had very good leadership in our group. So we, we went back and forth between General Assembly and small language groups. There were four English-speaking groups, like three Italian, three or four Spanish, one, only one German, surprisingly, and two or three French. Um, my math probably doesn't add up. There were 13 in all, but I'm, I'm pretty close. I know there were four English, um, and I was in Anglicus A. Um, coming into the Synod, a lot of us, myself included, oh, I should say one other thing. Um, in the small groups, everyone could talk. Um, so I tried to make up for a little lost time. I think some of the other experts did too. Um, but what, we, we actually couldn't vote, only the bishops. So the, the experts, the auditors, the fraternal delegates could all give input, but we, we didn't, when it came to voting on things, um, only the bishops had a vote. But it very quickly became evident if you put forward an idea or a proposal, you could very quickly get a bishop to adopt it, and he would say, write that down for me. So you write it up and give it to the bishop, and the bishop would put it forward as a motion, and the group would vote on it. So um, <laughs> before I went to the synod, I, had, um, I was at a dinner, and an older Dominican was there. And I told him I'd been appointed, and he said, you are going to write, 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 write. And he was right. That's <laughs> what I did. I, when I was in the general assembly, I was a scribe and transcribed all, and when it's small, we're in small groups, I was writing stuff for the bishops and helping draft the, the group summaries, and so it was a lot of writing, but it was, it, was, it was a great experience. Coming into the synod, a lot of us, myself included, were very unhappy with the working document. Thought it was very poorly done. Uh, the first part especially, I mean, it was like bad sociology. Um, one of the bishops in one of his general assembly interventions, a bishop from the United States, I will not say who, um, said it was, dis it, it was depressing. It was like an invitation to pastoral despair. Um, and I mean, absolutely spot on, I think. Um, it just was, it was unclear, it was garbled, it was, so, so a, lot, a lot of us a lot, and a lot of the bishops were like, let's just scrap this and let's start over. And Cardinal Baldessari made it clear, no, we're not starting over. We're on this journey. This is part of a process. So you can take the working document and improve it, but you can't throw it out. So then it became clear, our task in three weeks is to take this thing and rewrite it as thoroughly as we can to try to make it as good as we can. Um, and I, <laughs> so the three weeks of the Synod were spent revising the three parts of the working document. So the first part um, deals with something that we've seen in church documents since the Second Vatican Council, scrutinizing the signs of the, the times, looking at what are the challenges and what are the signs of hope facing the family in the world today. In the, first, in the working document, there was way too much negative, one. Um, but as many bishops pointed out, bishops from Africa and Asia, I mean, all the negativity, I mean, it might reflect a lot of what's going on in Europe and the United States. It doesn't reflect what's going on in the church in their parts of the world. So, I mean, it was way too Western centric and there were too many shadows and not enough lights. So we really, I mean, we, we reworked the first part, I think, um, 
I think it's a lot more balanced. It's better. Uh, the second part, the family and the plan of God, it was very, it was kind of thin and garbled and we, I, we've got something, I think, in the, in the final report that is much more, it's a nice exposition of the family and God's plan of salvation in scripture and the church's teaching, um, especially summarizing, highlighting some of the contributions of the modern magisterium, Paul VI, um, Pope John Paul II, Pope Benedict. Um, and then part three, part three, the mission of the family today. And this is where we got to some of the challenging issues. And this, frankly, in the small groups and in the General Assembly is where it became clear there were real differences among the participants there, among the bishops and among um, other people participating in the synod. Um, and of course, this is where the media wanted to kind of fixate and focus, but most of the groups were able, I think, to stay focused on, no, we're, we're focused on the big picture here. So yes, we dealt with um, and discussed and had differences in our discussion on the church's pastoral care of uh, divorced and civilly remarried persons, ministry to same-sex attracted persons, and ministry to wounded families. A number of us pointed out, I was certainly one of them, but not by any means the only one, the whole language of wounded families is problematic because all families are wounded in some way, because we're all wounded by original sin, our own personal sin, each other's sin. There are no unwounded families, right? There are families with greater structural challenges, right? Because of the death of a spouse, because of tragedies like divorce, because of broken family. Yes, that's true. But let's not do this whole wounded healthy thing. That's, that's not helpful, I think. But there, were, there was a lot of other issues in part three that the synod dealt with, the family's role in evangelization, the factors and persons who help form the family. Um, we need better formation of families, of couples, and better formation of those who are pastorally ministering to families. The gift of children, the challenges of raising children, the blessings of raising children. So in the end, at the end of three weeks, we came out with a document that was I think significantly better than the Instrumentum Laboris, by no means perfect, especially in the third part. There was language where we had sharply different views and the final writing committee. Um, what would happen is the small groups would pass, would, would draft language and put it forward. That language would then be sent to groups of experts and bishops. I was in some of those groups as well, which would vet the modi, the modifications of the Instrumentum Laboris and decide which ones should be sent forward, which one should be set aside, which one should be combined, because they were really saying the same thing in different language. But it was the writing committee uh, comprised of 10 bishops, cardinals, who made the final decision. Some of the language is just not completely clear. Um, some people would say it's muddled. Cardinal Pell prefers to say it's incomplete. Doesn't give a complete, uh, I'll, I'll go with Cardinal Pell. I could, I could go either way on that. Um, the overall approach of the synod, a lot of the bishops themselves commented on this, and the three parts of the synod kind of follow from this. It's the basic method of pastoral theology, see, judge, act. You see the situation in the world around you, you judge or discern it in light of the gospel, and then you engage pastorally and try to move forward in your accompaniment. That word got a little overused at the synod, I think, but I mean, it's, 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 it's the right impulse anyway, accompanying families. What's important to recognize is, and I think this is really, this is key to understanding Pope Francis. We're now in the year of mercy, the Jubilee year of mercy. Mercy and truth are not opposed to one another. It's not like if we emphasize mercy, we have to downplay truth, or if we emphasize truth, we have to squelch mercy. It's not true. It's not a zero sum game. Um, that were involved in here. Um, everyone agreed at the Synod, all the delegations of all the bishops from all the different parts of the world agreed, we're not here to change the church's doctrine on marriage or, or its moral teaching, um, but to try to find pastoral practices that deal with the actual situation and challenges that families face, but also rightly reflect what the church teaches. So we don't have to put orthodoxy and accompaniment in opposition to each other. 
Um, the, the quote here, this is actually a pair, of, this is Cardinal Pell in, in one of his public con uh, comments after the Synod. He said, there were differences of opinion, but overall it was a mature Christian conversation. And I mean, in my small group, we had sharp differences of perspective, especially with some of those, you know, kind of difficult pastoral issues. But contrary to what I told people when I got back, there were no, you know, uh, chairs thrown or anything like that. It was, a, it was a mature Christian conversation. What Pope Francis wants us to, I think, understand is that in proclaiming mercy, we are proclaiming truth. Jesus Christ is God's mercy, God's offer of mercy to us. He is also the fullness of truth. So we don't, in, in our teaching, we, what we're doing is inviting people to encounter both of those realities in encountering Christ. There is kind of, I think, a false narrative out there about Pope Francis. Um, in the media, certainly, but among many pundits, too. And the, the, the narrative goes something like this. John Paul II, he was the pope of the family. He was all in on family. His ministry was all about family. Um, pope Francis, not really interested. He's interested in the environment. He's interested in the poor. He's interested in other things, not family. We've moved on. Hmm. Um, consider this. Among the first major acts of St. Of John Paul II's pontificate was to call a synod on family that led to his apostolic exhortation, Familiaris Consortio. Among the first major acts of Pope Francis's pontificate was to call two synods on family. Um, that's not accidental. He called two synods. He fulfilled his predecessor's promise to come to the World Meeting of Families in Philadelphia. He didn't have to do that. Um, since December of last year, up until uh, the announcement of the Jubilee Year of Mercy, the theme of his catechesis has changed, he's been devoting, he devoted most of his weekly general audiences to an extended catechesis on family. These are not the actions of a man who is uninterested in family. If we look at what he's actually taught and said, as he repeatedly invites people to do, because Pope Francis has a thing about saying things, I don't know, that raise people's blood pressure, especially when he gets on airplanes. Anyone see the internet meme of Sean Bean as, uh, Sean Bean as Ned Stark kneeling on his sword, and it says, brace yourselves, Pope Francis is on a plane with reporters. Uh, there is... There's something about this poet. He says stuff, but he knows he says stuff. And he's saying stuff so that people actually listen. And did he say that? Why, why did he say, And try to dig in a little bit. Whenever he's, the question is brought up to him, he says, read what I've actually written. Read what I've taught. So let's do that. If you look at his first encyclical, which he tells us was 80% Benedict, he just kind of finished it. Lumen Fide, the light of faith. He speaks of marriage and the family as a sign of faith and love in the scriptures. In his, I think, signature document, Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, um, he speaks of the crisis of family as it's been impacted by individualism and consumerism. Um, he has spoken repeatedly of family as domestic church, like the Second Vatican Council and St. John Paul II. He has spoken of the family having a mother and a father as being a non-negotiable good, not to be I, uh, uh, altered by ideology and the importance of the complementarity of male and female at the Humanum Conference sponsored by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. In Laudato Si, his encyclical on the environment, he speaks of the family as the heart of a culture of life. And these are not one-offs. I, I can find multiple references to all of these ideas in that almost year-long catechesis on the family that he's done. These are not the words of a man who is uninterested in family. So the narrative that's out there, I think, is wrong in significant ways. When we were at the Synod, it was not entirely clear to us how, what the result of the Synod would be. Um, I'll say a little bit more about this at the very end. Um, but would Pope Francis simply receive the Synod's report and then, you know, kind of move on? Would he allow the Synod report to be published? But everyone knows if it, even if it weren't published, it would be leaked. So, I mean, it was going to get out one way or the other. But it wasn't clear to us whether he was actually going to write his own document. 
now seems very clear, and all the indications are he is writing his own document in response to the synod. So I think he's received, again, at least the input coming out of this synod, I think, is fairly strong. It's, he has, he has a, a fair amount of material to work with. It's clear that the synod itself saw the need for better formation for families and those who minister for them, deeper and more effective preparation for marriage, but not just before marriage. What we don't do well and what we do almost none at, not at all is ongoing formation and support for married couples, post-Cana marriage ministry. This is a whole untouched field within the church. And this is something that all families need, not just wounded families, whatever those are, and rightly understood, that's all of us. Um, but the real point of all of this, the real point of the synod, and this came out from the bishops themselves, it's clear, I think, from Pope Francis, is the point of these synods is to equip families to be not just objects of the church's ministry, but subjects of the church's ministry, and especially of uh, the new evangelization. This is really the centerpiece of Pope Francis's pontificate, the invitation that we hear very forcefully in Evangelii Gaudium, the invitation to an encounter with the person of Jesus Christ. He says, I invite all Christians everywhere at this very moment to a renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ, or at least an openness to letting him encounter them. I ask each of you to do this unfailingly each day. No one should think that this invitation is not meant for him or her, since no one is excluded from the joy brought by the Lord. And in doing this, all he's doing is echoing the teaching of three of his recent prominent predecessors. Pope Benedict, in his first encyclical, God is Love. Being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon, a decisive direction. John Paul II, in his encyclical on moral theology, Veritatis Splendor, in order to make this encounter with Christ possible, God willed the church. That's stunning language. The point of the church is to make the encounter with Christ possible. Pope Paul VI, the first pope to use the words new evangelization, said that evangelization is, evangeliza, evangelizing excuse me, is in fact the grace and vocation proper to the church, her deepest identity. She exists in order to evangelize. So Pope Francis is very clear that the church is to be a church of mission, a church which goes out, um, a church which goes forth, and that this is the task of every baptized person. He writes in Evangelii Gaudium, in virtue of their baptism, all of the members of the people of God have become missionary disciples. Um, the family in the bottom picture of the slide um, that couple was actually at the synod. They were observers, auditors, um, Mazimo and Patriza, and their youngest son, David, was with them, um, the little baby that's being held by his mom. If you, go, if you go on Google Images or whatever, if you look for pictures of this, you'll see a lot of pictures of David. Um, I showed you those pictures of popes kissing babies. Popes are, uh, or babies are pope bait. When you're in Rome, you'll see people <laughs> rushing to the, the front of crowds with babies because they, they hope to lure a popo. I don't know if you saw the, new, the news coverage in Philadelphia of people with yeah. Francis's uh, pope mobiles going down the street and people are passing babies up 10 rows so secret service agents can run out and have the pope kiss their baby. I'm scratching my head watching this saying, I'm sorry, I, I love the pope and I'd love him to, you know, I'm not passing my kid up through 10 rows of strangers to have him kiss. But anyway, so baby David was with us at the Synod. You'll see lots of pictures of baby David. But um, this family, by the way, it's an Italian family. They live in the Netherlands doing full-time missionary work. It's, fam it's a family living. The they have 12 children, by the way, a good apostolic number. Um, I'm, ju I'm just saying. But this is, I mean, this is what Pope Francis is calling families to be agents to be active protagonists of the new evangelization. You may remember at the beginning of his pontificate, Pope Francis gave that interview in America Magazine um, where he used the beautiful image of the church as a field hospital. 
and said, the thing the church needs most today is the ability to heal wounds, to warm the hearts of the faithful. It needs nearness, proximity. I see the church as a field hospital after battle. It is useless to ask a seriously injured person if he has high cholesterol and about the level of his blood sugars. You have to heal the wounds. Then we can talk about everything else. Heal the wounds, heal the wounds. And you have to start from the ground up. So why two synods on family for Pope Francis? So that families hear this invitation, so that families are equipped to be not just recipients of the church's evangelizing mission, but active participants and subjects of it. In other words, coming into the field hospital of the church, encountering Christ the great physician, and beginning to experience the healing that comes with, from that, families are in turn invited to in, invite others to come and experience that same healing, uh, to be part of this effort that Pope Francis is calling the church to be all in on, the new evangelization. So uh, in closing, <laughs> I want to put on my theological hat for a few minutes. Um, you all, of course, are familiar with The Princess Bride. Um, this, of course, is Inigo Montoya, best known for his repeated line, hello, my name is Inigo Montoya, you killed my father, prepare to die. But the other thing which he said, not quite as much, um, but in response to Vicini's continued use of the word inconceivable, um, he responded, you keep using that word. I don't think you know what it means. The, the word mercy, certainly before and even at the Synod, was used a great deal. And of course, now we're in the year of mercy. But again, there has to be an understanding of what we do and don't mean by that in order to be clear on, on, on the use. Again, sometimes the word mercy, when it's invoked, one gets the impression that in order to emphasize mercy, we have to kind of downplay truth or we have to minimize certain uh, truths. So a couple of kind of uh, critical reflections in, in closing here. It's worth remember, and I'll give you actually on the next slide, um, and we'll, we'll do some questions uh, for as long as you'd like, um, but I'll give you some bibliography to support some of these points I'm going to make here. It's worth remembering that synod documents in and of themselves do not enjoy teaching authority. The teaching of the Second Vatican Council on a collegial epis a, a, Episcopal collegiality, the bishops as a college succeed the 12 apostles. The Pope is the successor of Peter as the Bishop of Rome. The bishops all together enjoy teaching authority when they are teaching in concert with one another and united with their head. But you cannot have a group of bishops, even a somewhat representative group of bishops appointed from around the world to speak on behalf of all of the bishops. Doesn't work that way. It's only the bishops as a college um, who enjoy teaching authority within the church. So therefore, what are synod documents? Synod documents are input by the bishops in collaboration with, but in support of the teaching ministry of the Pope. Um, they are giving, it's, I mean, synod documents are working documents. They're input given to the Pope for his reflection and what he chooses to do with them in his own teaching ministry is really up to him. It's only when the bishops teach together in an ecumenical council that they have, uh, they enjoy the full teaching weight of the College of Bishops. I'll give you a reference to a very good essay on this point by Larry, um, Larry Welch. We need further clarification um, on the church's understanding of the admission of divorced and civilly remarried Catholics to the sacraments in light of the fact that we do have settled teaching on this, actually definitive teaching at the Council of Trent, but which was repeated um, in the form in, in, in the modern magisterium by St. John Paul II in Familiar's Consortio 84, 
and Pope Benedict in Sacramentum Caritatis 29. Um, there's a clear teaching and a clear practice that connects to that teaching. In, ironically, section 84 of the Relatio, the report of the Synod, what we have is a partial citation of Familiar's Consortio 84. That is that we need discernment of cases because there isn't always equal responsibility when a marriage fails. That's, that's clearly true. Everyone, everyone concurs with that. But in terms of a practice that corresponds to that, that Synod document, it mentions a penitential path, it mentions the internal form, it mentions a number of things, but it doesn't really, it's not coherent. So again, it's either incomplete, Cardinal Pell's take, or it's muddled, um, which is, I mean, again, I think, I think either reading is, is justifiable. It is clear, however, the only place where this final report mentions communion for the divorced is in 83, where it speaks of those who have divorced and not remarried civilly, who are sustained in their state by reception of the Eucharist. There's no mention of communion for the divorced and civilly remarried in the final report. But this is something where we, we need further clarification from Pope Francis, because right now what, what the Synod left us with is the writing committee tried to achieve kind of compromise language. Compromise language doesn't always clarify. It is important as well to clarify, I mean, everyone agreed, all the bishops' delegations, even from parts of Europe, um, <clears throat> you can, you can you fill in whatever nationality you'd like, um, agreed that you know, we're not here to propose doctrinal change. We affirm the indissolubility of marriage, but we need a pastoral strategy of mercy. And I'm referencing in particular Cardinal Casper's proposals. Um, if we implement something like Cardinal Casper's proposals as a pastoral accommodation, those pastoral changes have doctrinal weight. There's no way that they don't. Again, on the bibliography, I'll show you in a moment, there's an excellent essay by Nicholas Healy and a group of six Dominicans, John Corbett, five other Dominicans, and a canon lawyer, Kurt Martins, which I think make that case very, very clearly. Um, some of what has been put forward in the name of a pastoral practice, you can't understand as not having doctrinal significance. St. John Paul II has already warned us in Veritatis Splendor, which I mentioned earlier, of a false dichotomy between theology on the one hand, or doctrine, and pastoral solution. Good pastoral practice flows from good theology. Again, mercy and truth, not, not in, at odds with one another. We don't have to play them off of each other. We need an articulated practice of mercy that corresponds to the truth of what we profess about marriage. And part of that is that the indissolubility of marriage is God's mercy for us. It's an offer of God's grace when we understand it rightly. It's liberating. It's not a legal requirement. I mean, Jesus makes this very clear in his discussion with the Pharisees in Matthew 19, 3 through 9. There's at times, and I even heard this at times in the Synod, both in the small groups and in the general assembly sessions, an appeal to experience, the experience of an individual, the experience of groups of people within the church. And I mean, experience is important, that's true. But we have to remember experience, our experience, my experience, the experience of all of us is the experience of fallen people living in a fallen world. So it's only as we encounter Christ and in the words of the council, Christ reveals us to ourselves that our experience is transformed. There's a beautiful account of the transformation of human experience by the encounter with Christ. It's called the Confessions of St. Augustine. No, I'm very serious. It's actually a very careful philosophical account of how conversion and the experience of conversion and coming into the Christian community transforms human experience so that even Augustine's experience of his past sins and his bondage to sin could become a source of praise um, and a source of his gratitude for God's 
liberation of him. So yes, experience, but Christian experience is a fruit of our encounter with Christ. It's not independent of it. And it can't be used as an independent source to trump scripture or to trump the church's teaching. Hans Urs von Balthasar, the great 20th century Swiss Catholic theologian says that mature Christian experience, the kind of experience on which we can reliably draw as a source for doing theology is found in the lives of the saints. That's where we see purified human experience, experience that's been purified by the encounter with Christ that we can reliably use to reflect theologically. Finally, we need some clarification about the theology of the body. St. John Paul II's catechesis on the body, which I think, which many people think, are a wonderful tool for evangelization and catechesis in the church's effort in the new evangelization. What they enable us to do is reconnect who we are as human beings, as body persons, as male and female, as married, single, celibate, with scripture and with the encounter with Christ. The theology of the body catechesis, when we read them rightly, kind of mentor us in how we ought to be reading scripture as a, as the, as a place along with the liturgy where we encounter the person of Christ and where we can find our own lives and experience illumined by that encounter. So the theology of the body and important to, now of course, I mean, Pope Francis is not gonna simply replicate the theology of the body. He has his own uh, unique gifts and this is a different moment in the life of the church, but many of the bishops at the synod, and I share their opinion said, we don't want to lose this important treasure because it is, it is a gift for the church at this moment of our history. Final thought. One of the, uh, I mentioned one of the bishops in our small group was Archbishop Richard Smith, Bishop of Edmonton, um, Canada. When he found out that um, I had done some previous work um, on the whole uh, question of gender, and what was discussed at the Synod is gender ideology. He was like, well, we need to talk more. So we went out to lunch one day. But over lunch, he made a point I thought was just absolutely profound and, and absolutely right. And so I'll end with this. He said, we have to recognize that the effect Pope Francis has on people in and outside of the church is a specific grace for this moment of time in the church. If you watch the news coverage of Pope Francis when he came to the United States, and I mean, I'm listening to news anchors gush over this man, and I keep looking and saying, it says CNN at the bottom of the screen. It doesn't say EWTN. How can this be? But I mean, there's something about this man, his, his humility, his simplicity, the way he, he is his authenticity, for lack of a better word, that disarms people and that disarms kind of the hostility, the growing hostility that we see toward the church in the United States and Canada and Europe. Pope Francis kind of puts that at bay a little bit. That's an opportunity for us to actually hear the call that Pope Francis is giving us and step forward as part of the new evangelization. Pope Francis has this effect we have a moment in time, we have an opportunity to invite people to this encounter with Christ that he's put at this, as the centerpiece of his ministry. So we need to recognize the, the grace that we have in this particular moment of the church's life and in, this, and in Pope Francis's leadership. So some suggestions for your further reading. Um, you, can, you can peruse these. I'll stop talking now um, and open the floor for your questions or comments. So thank you. <clears throat> yes, please. You mentioned that um, St. John Paul II held the Synod on gender. Yes.
Um, so to your first question, great question. Um, if Familiars Consortia was cited and it might have been one, well, it was not much, um, if at all. So that was one of many problems with the working doc. And there were, I mean, it, there was no concept of natural law. There was no, uh, it, there was, a, there were significant omissions and um, problems. The final report of the Synod, yes, um, it makes reference to, it mentions Familiars Consortio, the Theology of the Body Catechesis by name. It mentions Pope Paul VI and Humani Vitae. Um, Paul VI, John Paul II, Benedict XVI each receive a paragraph. They deserve more, but they, they receive a paragraph in the final report of the Synod. So there's a greater recognition of the contributions of their magisterium to the modern teaching of the church. And again, I mean, I don't think Pope Francis is threatened by his predecessors in any way. He has a different style and a, a, he brings something different to the table. Um, so I would expect as, as if, you've, if you read Pope Francis's own documents, he engages, um, Interestingly, not just John Paul II and Benedict XVI, he, he very much engages the thought of Paul VI and does it um, quite often, um, actually. So I would expect that, I would expect that to, con so again, the, the, the final report, I think much improved on that point. Great, great question. Other questions, please. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, in terms of, um, I think the number of things that came up was, of course, was a topic, and that's not right. necessarily related to Western Synod, but my understanding is divorce happens in the Western culture right. as well. That, I mean, that's a Western world issue. I, so I, I'm just asking a little bit more, maybe. Uh, no, I mean, it's a great, great question. So, yeah, I, divorce would be an example, I think. Um, there's a divorce epidemic in the United States and Europe. There is divorce in Africa and Asia, but much at a much, much lower rate. So it's not, it's not the pressing pastoral issue that it is for the United States. And the African bishops, the Asian bishops pointed that out. Um, in, we had people with us um, from Mumbai in India, and their biggest problem dealing with marriage is they have so many couples coming to the church for marriage, they don't have enough priests and laity to actually do marriage preparation. Uh, that they, I mean, their, their marriage preparation classes have thousands of people come. So they're dealing with, we, we, you know, we're living in a culture where commentators, social scientists are saying we're in a post-marriage culture. You know, people are afraid of marriage. They're afraid of commitment because of the divorce epidemic. Th those are, I mean, and those are real pastoral problems for the U.S. and for Europe, not so in other parts of the world. Um, so, and the whole, the, the cultural redefinition of marriage, um, which kind of at the top of the pastoral agenda in Europe and the United States, sidebar discussion, um, but it's, it's probably worth mentioning here. Yeah, a lot of discussion after the Supreme Court's decision in Obergfell about, you know, the Supreme Court redefined marriage. I don't think that's true. I think we as a culture redefined marriage over a half century ago when we took fertility out of marriage with widespread contraception and then with uh, the acceptance of no-fault divorce laws in many places. When, once you take fertility and permanence out of marriage, marriage has been redefined. Marriage is now a, a commitment between a adults for a period of time who profess to love each other. By that logic, there isn't a good argument to make against two men or two women marrying, but there's also not a good argument to make against three or four or five adults marrying, as Justice Roberts pointed out in his dissent to the court's opinion. Um, polyamorous marriage, polygamous marriage, that's not just going to be a problem confined to Africa. That's a, you know, all, there are already challenges in, in the United States. Um, so the culture has effectively redefined marriage. But again, that's pretty much a, a Western perspective. And so the, the bishops from Africa and Asia 
Um, I think they were very effective in pushing back, especially against the part one in the instrumental labora saying, this is a totally Eurocentric perspective on the problems <laughs> facing the church. We have a different set of problems, but a different set of blessings as well. So thank you. Um, yes, in back row. Questionnaire, sure. Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, I mean, yes, I think part of, our, part of our challenge, part of the challenge for all of us at the Synod was recognizing that, I mean, fam the issue of family touches so many other issues. So it touches, you know, young adults, it touches singles, it touches. And so, I mean, how do you keep the focus on family and yet say something in, so, I mean, I think those concerns were there. Um, and I think in his own way, Pope Francis is really speaking to some of those concerns because Pope Francis has been very emphatic that family is not just the nuclear family of parents, children. Family rightly understood, richly understood in scripture and the church's life and tradition is multi-generational. Um, and that's something that our individualist and increasingly consumer societies has been undercutting. We've been losing that, that intergen the intergenerational bonds and the way that can be a source of strength for young couples dealing with young kids. Um, so part of it is we need to recover a broader notion of family so that when the church speaks about family, single people and young families as well as grandparents and older families all hear themselves being addressed um, because we've opted into kind of a false understanding of family, the, the, the nuclear family, whatever. The, I, I mean, are, are we like radioactive or something? I don't know what, the, but that's kind of what people have, have latched on to. I, I, I hate to do this, but, but I should be a steward of our, of our time. Um, sure, sure, absolutely. So one more question. Yes, please. Mm. I mean, that's a, that is a great question. I think there was, there was discussion, and again, this discussion begun by John Paul II, continued by Benedict XVI, and carried forward at the Synod. We need to help people who are divorced and civilly remarried understand that they are not excommunicated from the church. They are members of the church. They are part of the church's life. They need to be welcomed and supported and integrated into the church as fully as we can. Um, we need to do a better job catechizing people so they understand why those people are unable to participate fully in the church's sacramental life, even though they are still members of the church, and understand the, they're not exceptions, but the, the ways, the instances in which that teaching doesn't hold. So if someone receives a decree of nullity, saying that their first marriage was not sacramental, they're free to enter into a second sacramental marriage. If they're in danger of death, if they are living as brother and sister in their second in their second marriage, people can participate in the church's sacramental life. So, but clearly the, the, I think the thrust of the conversation at the synod, and I think this is, this is probably 
based on our own ministry um, to couples both before and after marriage, we really need to do a much better job on the front end before marriages fail, preparing people for marriage, but then accompanying them once they are married. In other words, to, to engage the whole Christian, because we're living in a society where there's less support for marriage than there was in previous generations, the whole Christian community has to be all in on supporting and, I'll use the word, accompanying couples once they have married. Once, they, once they've married each other. We can't just say, all right, now you're married, go have a nice life together, don't forget to bring your kids back and have them baptized. That, no, that doesn't work, right? So just as people living religious life or a priestly ministry need ongoing support and formation to live their vocation, so do married couples. So post Cana ministry, I think, is a crucial missing link. Does that help people who are in that situation of being divorced and civilly? No but it certainly might help less people find themselves in that situation if we do a better job forming and supporting people before and during marriage and during moments of hardship in marriage because those are inevitable. Thank you all, wonderful questions.